Uh, welcome all to the UBC Sociology Department's launch celebration day. Uh, as the outgoing chair of the Distinguished Speaker Series, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Arlie Hochschild. But first, I wanted to thank uh, fellow committee member Lindsay Richardson and our two graduate student uh, members, Patara and Isha, for all their hard work in putting this year's slate of speakers together, even amidst the difficult times and the uncertainty. I'd also like to give a shout out to Christine and Guy and everyone that's been working behind the scenes since spring and then over the summer and now to make today and, all, and hopefully the entire term run smoothly. And finally, uh, I'd like to note two other things. If you are tuning in with us today, please keep your microphones on mute. And if you could turn your video off during the talk, it'll increase our bandwidth. And for the Q&A, if you have any questions for uh, Professor Hochschild, uh, please post them in the chat box and Guy and or Brent will moderate that at the end. Now for our speaker, Professor Arlie Hochschild is Professor Emerita at the University of California, Berkeley. The author of nine books and over 100 articles and book chapters, she is without a doubt one of sociology's most important and influential scholars. Her work created and developed the conceptual processes of emotion management, work and labor and force sociology to accept the fact that emotions matter. That like thoughts and actions, emotions too are controlled by external forces as well as regulated purposefully by individuals trying to align them situationally. And finally, emotions are resources unevenly distributed in expression and suppression. Her scholarship has been recognized nationally and internationally. She's won Guggenheim, Fulbright and Mellon fellowships and three American Sociological Association awards the Charles Cooley Award for the Managed Heart, the Jesse Bernard Award for the Second Shift, the Time Bind and Global Woman, and the Award for Public Understanding of Sociology for Lifetime Achievement. Additionally, in 2015, she was awarded the Ulysses Medal from University College in Dublin, Ireland. Finally, her New York Times bestseller book, Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning in the American Right, which she's going to be discussing today, was shortlisted for the 2016 National Book Award. On a personal note, it is without a doubt the greatest honor I've had in my capacity as the chair of this committee to introduce Professor Hochschild. As an undergraduate psychology student miserably stuck in a behavioral psychology program, I was exposed to her 1979 American Sociological Review piece on emotion work in a Sociology of Emotions course. It changed everything for me. I was already drawn to the study of emotions, but that paper reconstituted what I believed was possible. It not only made emotions interesting to study, but it spoke so forcefully and eloquently in defense of a sociological approach to emotions that was sorely lacking in anything I'd read to date. In short, it converted me to sociology. In my experience, it is rare to be able to thank the individuals who, like switchmen on a railroad, changed the course of one's own trajectory. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Arlie Hochschild. Wow, wow, wow. Wonderful, wonderful to be here uh, in this virtual way. And Seth, uh, uh, I'm very uh, moved and touched by your uh, words and uh, glad, to, glad to have you uh, in the chat box, so to speak, for uh, social emotions. So um, let me just uh, begin the time uh, we have uh, to say that we are 10 weeks uh, away from what I think is one of the most um, ominously important elections of uh, who will be the next American uh, president. And a recent survey uh, found that um, among Democrats and Republicans, something like a two thirds thought we may be heading for a civil war, for a civil war. So um, this, uh, this is not an idle topic uh, it, that we're discussing. Um, it takes the best minds of us all to figure out our next steps forward. Um, and so uh, it's in that spirit that I share with you uh, thoughts that um, I have. I thought I would start first by uh, 
taking you with me on a journey that began in 2011. Um, some of you have read this book, but so this will be a little refresher and some have not. Um, in 2011, I decided that um, there was uh, a new movement was afoot, the Tea Party movement. And at that time, no one was talking about Donald Trump, but there was a pre-Trumpist ferment in the culture, a century on the idea of the Tea Party. And I realized that teaching and living here uh, in Berkeley, California, I was in a, uh, a, a blue state bubble. It was a geographic bubble, California's Democratic state, Bay Area super Democrat, and here I am teaching sociology at UC Berkeley. So, blue, blue, blue bubble. It was a media bubble. People around here are reading the New York Times, uh, the Atlantic Monthly, the New Yorker. They're not, uh, uh, in fact, they're purposely avoiding uh, Fox News. So it was a media bubble. And it was also an electronic bubble. Uh, like you, my computer gives me back to myself through algorithms so that I have the uh, impression of being surrounded by uh, people who share um, my interests. So I wanted to get out of this bubble and to find uh, a bubble that was as far to the right as UC Berkeley, California was to the left. Where would that be? Well, 2011, the, the most conservative uh, and uh, hard nose was in the South. Okay, but where in the South? Well, how about the super South? Well, that would be Louisiana and, uh, or Mississippi. And it happened I knew one person who was the mother-in-law of a former student of mine at Berkeley, uh, who lived in Louisiana. And um, so I also, there were other reasons for Louisiana. If I looked at the proportion of whites who voted for Barack Obama um, in 2012, uh, for the whole region of the South, it was 30%. But uh, for Louisiana, it was 14%. So I thought, okay, let me, let's try Louisiana. And within Louisiana, southern Louisiana is the center of the petrochemical and oil industry. I thought that would be a good place. So um, I, I took with me uh, a method, which is to turn my alarm system off and to permit myself to have a great deal of curiosity uh, and interest in people with whom I knew I would have profound differences. And to try and um, build an empathy bridge with those very people. And I took with me also a question that I came to call the red state paradox. I've been very uh, inspired by what's the matter with uh, Kansas, uh, Frank's book. And um, so turned that question around a little bit. Uh, and it, it could be put like this. Why is it that across the whole country, it is the poorest states, the states with the worst education, uh, the highest crime rates, most people in jail, uh, the um, most unemployment, uh, the uh, highest rates of pollution, the lowest life expectancy are also those states that take more money from the federal government in aid than they give to it in tax dollars and revile the federal government, big bad federal government. 
I mean, that's the paradox. Look, if you've got all these problems and you want to work on them and get better, wouldn't you welcome the government's help in it? So that was a paradox that I took with me, sort of like putting it in a backpack, just always seeing what I was seeing through that question. So with that question and that method and that place, I began doing uh, field work, which ended up uh, taking some five years. And I went to meetings of uh, the um, uh, Republican women of Southwest Louisiana. And look, they would have a gun ra uh, raffle and it's Lord's Prayer to be in. And, uh, I would always say to people exactly who I was, hi, I'm a sociologist in Berkeley, California, doing a book, like that. And so I was you know, the other, they, they understood that. And I went, I followed uh, a Republican Tea Party candidates at meet and greets uh, as they uh, crossed the state. And then, um, my focus ended up uh, quite by, I wouldn't say accident, but it, it came late when I discovered that on arriving at Lake Charles, I couldn't see the, the sky. You know, if I got my little rent car and crossed the I-10 bridge to um, West Lake, uh, my eyes began to sting. And then I realized, look, I'm in the middle of this uh, petrochemical center of development uh, and it's they don't believe in regulating polluters they are in a what turns out to be one of the the, the, the two percent most polluted counties Calcasieu County in the entire country and very high rate of cancer death for men so um, I also, as part of my strategy, found some environmentalists working on the pollution issue. And I said, um, are there any people that disagree with what you're doing? And one guy said, oh, yeah, I, I know a lot of friends and they just hate what I'm doing. I said, could I tag around and follow you around and meet these friends? And so that was a, another research strategy. Um, and um, snowballing all the time. So um, what did I find? I began to realize that the question I came in with uh, was not their question, it was my question, it was the wrong question from their point of view. That, well, yeah, we do need this help, we're embarrassed by it, but that's not what bothers us, we're just, ashamed of it. In fact, I ran into a kind of a Cajun uh, self-deprecatory sense of humor about it. Yeah, we're the second force, you know, we're dead bottom in education. <laughs> it was kind of a, a self-deprecatory shared laughter, like we know we're at the bottom and uh, we get that. You're not bringing in news. Um, but it wasn't something they wanted the government to do anything about. So I was, I was saying, okay, if that's not the question, what, what is the question? And from their point of view, they knew about the red state paradox, but they threw it aside. And something bigger was on their mind. And you could tell this something bigger in two kinds of ways. You could make a list of concerns. There's uh, right to life, there's gun control, there's uh, uh, role of the church and so on, or uh, taxes, cutting taxes and welfare. Um, and they wouldn't mention rates, but you could put it that way in a list of issues or you could tell it the way I began to want to tell it and did need to tell it as um, in a way that puts 
emotion primary. Um, and because behind any topic you would have, uh, there was a deep story. That is, if you were to stack up all the premises that these conversations boil down to, you could say those premises by telling a story, a narrative, which expressed those premises. And tell that story in the form like a dream, a metaphor, and then see how people respond to that. Is that your story? What do you think about it? Would you change it? And that's what I did. We called this the right wing deep story. And what is a deep story again? It's a story that feels true in a fundamental way. It feels like a baseline deep story. It's the distillation of deep feelings as told in a story. You take moral precepts out. You take information out. Deep story is not about rights and wrongs and truths. It's about feelings. And the story is this, that you're waiting in line. You, the right wing person, you're a pipe fitter. You've worked for 20 years and uh, no wage increase. Um, life's going down a little. You're not poor. Um, you're white, you're male, you're Christian, and you're waiting in line, and your feeling about yourself uh, is that it, you're law-abiding and you're hardworking. And ahead of you in line, as in a pilgrimage, is a mountain at the top of which is the American dream. You don't look behind that dream to the uh, kind of economic uh, machine that's constructing it, uh, deciding which jobs are leaving and coming. You're just looking at the dream and you're not looking behind you at all the people, many people who are behind you in line. You're just looking at yourself and the dream and uh, the line hasn't moved and your legs are tired. And then you see in another moment of this right wing deep story, some people seem to be cutting ahead of you in line. And who are they? Well, they are blacks and they are women who through federally mandated affirmative action programs are now uh, seeing job openings uh, for the first time uh, and uh, are being given opportunities that they didn't have before. Uh, they see ahead of them uh, also cutting in our uh, well-paid public officials. Think, well, look, I'm not paid that much. And after all, he's working for me, right? I'm through my taxes, I'm paying for him. Why has he got a nice house? Um, especially if it's his job to regulate the industry I work for. Uh, and then there's another person, or it seems like, that's cutting ahead of you in line. Uh, and that would be the uh, oil-soaked brown pelican, the Louisiana state bird that was rendered extinct because of the dioxin and pollutants. Uh, in uh, all the water bodies of Southwest Louisiana. And that um, oil-soaked pelican seems to be kind of uh, waddling up and stepping in line. That is, uh, regulations would defend animals ahead of people. And I heard that all the time. Oh, you know, these uh, far left uh, environmentalists, they put animals ahead of people. In fact, they're animists. They're not Christian, they, they uh, worship animals. So all of these line cutters, and then in the second moment of the right wing deep story, uh, there's Barack Obama who seems to be waving to the line cutters. Oh, he's their president, but not our president. He's with them. In fact, isn't he a line cutter? And how did he 
heard this a hundred times. How did I his mother was a single mother? She wasn't a rich woman, she was poor. How did she afford to send her son to Harvard, you know, to Columbia? Something rigged, something fishy. Um, so you know, finally, in a in another moment of the right wing deep story, there is um a point at which someone ahead of you in line, maybe someone from Vancouver, maybe a university person, really smart, well-spoken, turns around and says to those behind that person in line, you redneck, you prejudiced, racist, sexist, homophobic, fat redneck. And that's it. That's, oh, you know, first you're waiting, you're a good person, and then this, these epithets, these insults, these put downs. And uh, then you think, then, um, well, I'm, I'm not going to wait in this line. This is not my line. It's not my country. I need another leader. So that's the uh, right wing deep story. And I went back to the people that I come to know and said, I've got a story for you. I wonder what you think about it. One guy, the guy that opens the book, uh, Mike Schaff worked in oil all his life, said, you read my mind. That's exactly my story. Another one said, um, uh, how uh, I live your metaphor. And then another woman said, well, you've left things out of your story. You're not saying that the person waiting in line is paying the taxes that support these, these line cutters. And that's what's so incensing. And then another one said, yeah, we form another line behind another president, like secession. So, um, so I began to think that that, if we are really to integrate uh, an honoring of the, the steam of feeling that accumulates in pe from people's biographies, uh, we have to put it in a pictorial and narrative form. That's the way to think about it. So I then ended up thinking, well, I came in with this red state paradox, but I'm going out with a blue state paradox, because why is it that the Democratic Party doesn't speak to these people at all, doesn't, seems to have forgotten them, and um, that things are upside down, that it's the well to do the professionals that are voting Democratic and the poor that are voting Republican. And so I, the book is delivery to readers of that, um, that blue state paradox. Now, so what does this experience, this journey I've just taken you on with, that I was on, tell us about uh, possibilities of reaching out in this uh, really almost social hemorrhaging that's going on in the United States today. And um, is it, um, what's getting in the way of us talking across the boundaries? I think um, there are two, two things to first say. The first kind of barriers are structural. And the second kind of barriers are attitudinal. I like to talk about those and then to talk about the experience of reaching across. Um, in the United States, uh, 30 years ago, there used to be a union movement where people from different regions mixed and matched, got to know each other. And, uh, so men and women, different races, different regions would have a, a natural way of connecting with one another on issues of common interest, of working conditions. 
there used to also be a compulsory draft where again people from different regions and different social classes uh, got together. But now those uh, two institutional mixers and matches are gone out of the picture. And what we have is a politics now that coincides all too neatly with regional differences, rural, urban, with uh, social class differences. The uh, BA-less uh, uh, working class is inclining uh, to the uh, right, educated class to the left among whites. And it, it's cutting through uh, across races. So race, class, region, and the institutional mixers we don't have. We need new ones. But there, suppose you said, okay, I get it that uh, we don't have natural ways of meeting each other. There's a, we've sort of gotten bubbleized in a certain way. Um, but uh, I, I want to get out and meet other people that differ with me. Well, what would be the attitudinal barriers? I think the first one, uh, attitudinal barrier to uh, get out of your blue bubble and go into a, a red one or get out of your red one, get into a blue one, is that you don't think it's a good idea. You don't, it's, uh, you don't, number one, believe in empathy, let's say. Some people don't. They said, well, uh, one, you know, empathy's weak. What we really need is our tempers about us now. But we, we're in a war, you wanna be angry uh, in a war, so uh, empathy is, is weak. And nice, empathetic people are kind of weak. That's said about Biden now. Um, so that's a barrier. Then you think, well, what good is it to try and exercise this discredited thing? A second attitudinal barrier is to say, um, no, I, I'm, um, I believe in blame. I think that uh, to do my political work, it's a good day spent to uh, blame, criticize, and ridicule uh, people who are not like myself, that uh, believe differently. That that's, uh, I can stay in my bubble and uh, do that. And, and uh, a tacit assumption there is that blaming works. You don't anticipate a backfire such as we saw, saw in the deep story. Um, and you uh, actually think it's productive. Well, that's a very important cultural belief that gets in the way of finding a solution to reaching across. Um, and another kind of, um, of problem, I think, is in uh, thinking that, well, you're not the person to do this. I've talked to a number of young people who said, well, look, uh, good luck to you. Yeah, some people can cross over into enemy land, but not me. I had one, one woman that said, well, you know, I'm not the person to do it because I'm a woman and, uh, this kind of male-oriented culture. Um, I have a brother-in-law, he's a person of color, I'm bisexual, uh, Jewish, and she almost, it occurred to me, became a Christmas tree of victimhoods uh, that made it seem hard for her to reach out. And what I told her is, you know what, you don't have to. Unless you want to do this thing, it's not going to work, and you won't be happy to do it. So, Absolutely, there are lots of other things you can do. Get out the vote, you know, talk to young people, offer to work on a, as a poll, as a um, 
voter re registration person or on the polls on November 3rd and so on. Much you can do. You don't have to reach out. But it got me to thinking that um, when we think of ourselves in this armored kind of way, that too becomes an obstacle to the very desire to get to know what's going on on the other side. So um, the next question then, if we got rid of those barriers and we began to say no, empathy turns out to be golden. It's extremely precious. Uh, it's what the most effective politicians and even generals in wars have used to really understand what's going on. It's a reality test is it to, to, to really grok what's in front of you. Uh, hugely important. And that blaming is neither here nor there. You're talking to yourself. You're reaffirming your own status in your own bubble. And we all need to do that. And that's okay. But it gets in the way. It takes a lot of emotional energy. I think what's happened on the left, actually, sadly, is on a lot of campuses, uh, sort of a political, good political will, such good political will has gotten turned on itself and curled into itself, into a defensive posture. So people are talking to each other, judging each other, and there's no daring or social support for kind of reaching out. And um, so, uh, but if you thought, hey, that's a problem, and I'm going to be the first in my class to kind of get together with some others and see what I can do. Um, so if you got rid of all of those barriers, then, so what, how do you do it? Suppose you're with me, and you've, you've gone to some place that's maybe just two miles outside of Vancouver. We need to go further to a rural area where people are going to say, they're going to, fit, they're going to have a deep story, something like it, their version of it. And then how are you going to talk to them? Well, uh, let me give you examples of uh, my best luck and my worst uh, luck. <laughs> Um, uh, here's an example of something that happened to me. I was at the um, Republican Women of Southwest Louisiana and um, sitting at the table of eight, we were there eating our gumbos and the woman across the table said, uh, I love Rush Limbaugh. And I don't know if in Canada you, you know uh, about him. He was very angry, vocal, uh, super right wing, just given a, a, a medal by a Donald Trump. And so he was uh, her hero. And I thought to myself, oh, this is uh, terrible. Uh, she, she likes him. I always turn him off when I hear him on the radio. And then I thought, no, cross the empathy wall. I said, do you have a little time in the next few days? So I invite you to some sweet teas and you can explain what you love about Rush Limbaugh. And she said, sure. So next day we're having sweet teas. And she said, oh, I love Rush Limbaugh because he hates feminazis. So I asked her, what is a feminazi? Well, it's a woman who wants, uh, you know, uh, doesn't want to make dinner for her husband and doesn't like doors open for her and so on. And then she went into environmental wackos. I said, well, what is an environmental wacko? Well, someone who worships animals. And we got to talking and then she asks me, You're, I know you don't agree with uh, what, um, I'm saying, you've told me that. Um, is it hard for you to hear what I'm saying? And I said, actually, no, it's not hard at all. I have my alarm system off and I am so grateful to you for the time you're giving me and 
you're, you're teaching. I'm your student here, and I'm very grateful to you. So, no, it's not hard for me. And then she said, oh, I know what you're doing. I do that, too, with my parishioners in church. You know, they'll be talking with their problems. I have to set my problems aside. Or with my kids, they're mad at something and mad at me, and I don't know why. I have to set my own reactions aside. I know what you're doing. I can do that, too. I have an alarm system, and I can take it off. Then we had that in common. We had nothing else in common but that. And it became it became a very important thing, a deep thing to have in common. Then she later took me to her church. She was a singer, beautiful singer, and much else opened out uh, from that. So there's my worst experience was to see when I did the worst, it was to take home a transcript of an interview, very long interview, and I wasn't learning anything. It wasn't going anywhere. And I thought, what a terrible interview. Arlie, you're a terrible interview. Why are you, uh, why is this so boring? And then I realized that it wasn't that the person I was talking to was tight-lipped and didn't want to talk. It's that I would not let him talk because I didn't want to hear what he had to say. I wanted to be his friend, and he was saying things that were not friendship conducive. And I got anxious at that. I got nervous at that. So I realized that at least 49% of the time where I'm not getting anywhere in an interview is because of me and my uh, resistance, actually. So part of the fieldwork method involves inspecting our own resistance. What is it that we refuse to hear? What deep story am I defending? Because around every deep story is almost like a skin of holding information away and locking information in, and I had mine too. So those are an example of how, uh, how to and how not to. I just want to end by saying how uh, important I think this is to do, especially in this moment. I don't think that we can make any lasting progress in resolving this uh, political impasse of moving toward um, unless we reach out and we get good at reaching out. And I began to follow around the people that I thought were effective reacher outers. And uh, I think, just to give you one example, of uh, General Russell Honore, say three-star general, uh, African-American, who was an ardent environmentalist in his retirement, started something called the Green Army. And he would talk to people who who didn't at all uh, like environmentalists, business people who believed in freedom. And he did what I would call a value stretch, which I think is a main thing that in reaching out, we need to learn to do. He was talking one time, giving a speech to people who were big Trump people. They believed in freedom, freedom, to uh, start your business, freedom to get rich, freedom from owner's regulation, freedom. And he said this, you know, I woke up this morning, I looked out at Lake Charles, I saw a man in a fishing boat, that man had his rod out, and he was about to bring up a fish, but that man is not free to lift out an uncontaminated fish. I thought, brilliant. What had he done? He took their value, freedom. He didn't pass over it and say, no, no, I'm for justice. I don't care. He used their freedom, but made them reconceive of uh, uh, something they love to do, which is fishing. So 
we need to do that with symbols, take them and stretch them to new instances. I think that's a paradigm to use. And the best people, this is not hopeless, uh, Alexandria Cortez uh, got together with Ted Cruz, now you've got far right, far left, in sponsoring a bill to prevent Congress men and women from transitioning from political posts to lucrative jobs as lobbyists. They had that found that common ground. Um, you have uh, a Democratic congressman here, Ro Khanna, who got together with a Republican congressman in Kentucky to get a cold coding program going. So unemployed coal miners could learn how to code cell phones. So that kind of thing. And when you think of Nelson Mandela and Mahatma Gandhi, the great leaders in the world, they are uh, superb experts at crossing empathy bridges. And I think we need uh, not to fall into despair in this uh, concerning moment but to try and follow their lead. So let me stop there and open a discussion for any other questions that you want. Um, first of all, uh, tremendous thank you. Uh, a fascinating talk. Uh, really appreciate this. Uh, I'm going to try to moderate this, uh, the questions, and I'm going to give people a moment uh, as we work through the technology here and, and reach out to you. Um, and uh, I can, you can raise your hand, you can write in a question <clears throat> uh, in the chat box. Uh, and if you raise your hand, and there's a lot of hands to be ra raised, so I hopefully I will see your hand come up. Um, um, so I have a, uh, I'll, I'll read out uh, a couple of questions that have come in already. <clears throat> One is, a generational trauma seems to be an idea that is gaining traction in various fields. The idea being that traumas from previous generations are passed down and in some cases are made worse as they are passed down. To what extent do you think the adherence to particular social values seen in the South is tied to the concept of generational trauma? And this is E. Clary question. Mm. Um, Interesting. Um, maybe I'll ask a couple of questions. Okay, so I have a couple of questions and, and then you can sort of work your way through, through some. Uh, another question from Alexander Butterfield. Uh, how has the deep story changed under Trump? Uh, they are still standing in a line that's not moving, or is this why Trump is running as an outsider, even though he's the leader on the Hill? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, um, you know, on the generational trauma question, I mean, one has to look at which group one is. I, I think of blacks as having the generational trauma, but so many of them left uh, the South in the Great Migration. Uh, but for the whites that are left there and for whom, uh, uh, what they, their parents, some of their parents have been through the Depression and that was that was something they were afraid of. Um, but I'm not sure, uh, it's a wonderful idea to play with, but I'm not sure uh, where to take it for whites. I mean, you could say that they uh, are losing the Civil War again. I mean, they do identify with that flag. This is a region we were run over. Oh, now it's coming. Yeah, a lot of them saw environmentalists as like the carpetbaggers, you know, coming in, telling us what to do, putting us down. And, you know, after, you know, our fields were burned and our, our cattle were dead and, uh, you know, 
uh, our cities were decimated um, and the South was you know, conquered by the North. And uh, we were the bad guys. We were, we, we were the defeated people. And they do feel like uh, anything if you talk uh, about, you know, northerners coming to the south, oh, the here you come again, thinking you're better than us and bossing us around. So that would be a, a generational thing from their point of view. On the deep story, yes, I think that, and say in the book, that Trump is the deep story president. He is coming to rescue them from their slot in line and lift them forward. And uh, he's uh, not moved them up in line. Uh, I'm in Appalachia studying coal, coal miners. There's no more coal jobs in Appalachia now than there were uh, four years ago. Um, oil jobs, no, not, not really uh, more. Uh, though with the Arctic, they're, they're hoping, but these are highly automated industries now. And so we're not talking massive numbers of highly paid jobs. I mean, you can wreck the Arctic with just hiring 100 men, um, highly automated machines. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not a job creator, although it's posed as that. So he isn't effectively changing them, but there is a, he's raised a different mobility, not an economic mobility, but a socio-emotional mobility. He has lifted them up uh, in that way. And it's addictive, they love it. He's an antidepressant. He's, he's uh, oh, I guess I am somebody, you know. They, a lot of white men are actually feeling, oh, the left has no use for us, you know. What can we do that's right, you know. Um, we're blamed for this, we're blamed for that, we're scapegoated. And he's come to the defense, and you saw that in the Republican uh, convention. You know, he, he kind of, I think, played to the law and order moment. And law and order defending a new replacement in the line, moving people up in line. Um, and law and order preventing, you know, blacks and women from uh, moving ahead. Um, and in his convention, he basically uh, said, uh, he brought us the McCloskey family um, who had to defend their suburban home from Black Lives Matters, uh, protesters they felt. Uh, and so he held them up. Yes, those are people who are um, pretty far up in line and they're, they don't want the suburbs to have uh, others, poor people moving in. They're defending their way of life. So it's a kind of defense of a way of life that's affluent. And then you saw, I think, uh, an appeal to the, the defenders, the, the law and order people, or the would-be male defenders. So yes, he's transmuted the deep story, but he hasn't actually resolved any of the sources of the discontent that he exploits. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna remind people, I have here several more people with questions, so I'm gonna go through it this way, but please, you're welcome. If you press on the participants button, on the right-hand side, you'll get a, a list of participants, and on the bottom of that, you'll be able to press raise hand and then I'll be able to call on you. We'll be able to let you use the mic and you won't have to hear my voice as much and we'll get to hear more of Harley. Okay, um, Erica Milner, thank you for your talk. You mentioned about empathy as overcoming our labels of ourselves when speaking with people on the right. 
since Trumpism explicitly advocates for violence against POCs, how does this impact the ability of non-white researchers to do this research and still maintain their safety? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, you don't have to go to the, um, to the super extreme here. There is something called uh, the bridge movement. And for scholars of color, I think that would be a good first place to go. There, what is the bridge movement? It is a um, umbrella group, uh, umbrella over some 70 or 80 kind of startups of civic nonprofits uh, with names like Hi from the Other Side or a Living Room Conversations. And uh, they are uh, organized. And so what you do is you volunteer, hey, I'd like to get together in a conversation like um, living room conversations. Let me give you an example. It was uh, part of this bridge alliance. It's one group started by a mediation lawyer uh, named uh, Joan Blades. She was a co-founder of moveon.org and now it's founder of living room conversations. And we had one in my uh, living room with uh, a woman from uh, the introduction to uh, the preface to uh, Strangers in Their Own Land. And she's a super right winger. So what we did, and her son uh, turns out to be a uh, uh, Bernie Sanders supporter. So the two of them came to visit, stayed with us. So that uh, first I went there, and now a bunch of people are coming to visit me in Berkeley and uh, see see what the deep story here is. Anyway, uh, we had a living room conversation with some students of color in it. And that was a great way to do it. So what you have is a dozen people in your living room and you have some uh, snacks uh, on the table. And you begin by going around the table, what, what kind of country do you want to see? Often people agree uh, on what it is they would like to see. Um, and you would find conservatives saying, I want a, ra a racially just society. They would say that. And you would have conservative uh, uh, liberals saying, well, I, you know, I don't want looting. You know, I don't I like order. Um, so you would start with that and, and move around. So um, I think uh, it's also a, a thing to do to for students of color to find um, uh, conservatives of color. And I interviewed a bunch. They're not in the book because they weren't exactly part of the Tea Party movement, but um, they were against Obamacare and so on. So those would be two, um, two ways to go. And we could get an email conversation. I could see if I could help you do that. But I would love to see um, more uh, cross-racial conversations going. Yeah, it'd be great. One of your question, one of your comments uh, connects well to the next question by Professor in Public Policy, Ramana. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Do you have a sense of what is the corresponding deep story for Democrats or liberals? Are you in the process of writing a book about them too? <laughs> I, um, in, in the afterword, or the conclusion to Strangers, I outlined what I think uh, the deep story on the left is. Um, and uh, I didn't do interviews, but this is what I think it is. It begins also with a picture and a narrative. And in this picture and this narrative, um, there isn't a line. It's a big circle, and 
round or a square around um, uh, and we're holding hands, but we can always expand. So, uh, and in the middle of this a circle uh, is a public sphere, and at the center of it is a state-of-the-art uh, public children's museum, and it, it has all kinds of creative things, and it there is a hydroponic uh, you know, organic uh, vegetable garden and for children how to build their own. And people are so proud of it. You know, the best imaginative minds went into it. It's available to everybody. It doesn't cost anything, it's public. And we're proud of this. Either we're proud because we made that museum or we're proud because our tax money went to the people that made it. Um, and there's no begrudging it. We're proud to be the kind of society that creates a kind of a public richness. And you don't have to be rich uh, in our uh, utopian society. Now, the public is, is rich, so no super rich, so poor. But there's a public availability, the public libraries and public schools of high quality. And so in another moment of the left owing deep story, um, a man comes around with an excavator and a big truck and he, he, he pulls it forward and he gouges out the foundation of this state of the art children's um, science museum and takes all these chunks of concrete out in a way. And with that, he builds himself a McMansion in a private gated community outside uh, the public sphere. And the people who have funded this public thing and have created this, who work as public sector workers, who are proud of it, are furious. We're mad at that. That's divestment of something that we kind of believe can hold a diverse culture together. And so uh, I think the anguish of, of that uh, is animating a lot of people I think that's the basic deep story on the left. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question from Yisha Zhang from our department. Following up on the question about deep story, have you tried your deep story about the red bubble on people from the blue bubble? How did they react to the deep story as a sociological method? Um. You know, um, um, I haven't, uh, I, you know, the work is out there. I, uh, uh, <coughs> I haven't talked to uh, methodologists about it. I think they're looking it over. They're figuring out, hey, you know, all I would say is try it out. Give it a whirl. See, if, see where you go. If it doesn't work, figure out something else. But um, I think you learn a lot uh, doing it that way, as opposed to a survey. Um, it's interesting how the metaphor of line cutting has actually been confirmed in quantitative research. They have found that people who do feel like they're being cut ahead of in line um, are, uh, that's highly correlated with voting for Donald Trump. So as a metaphor, it, yeah, there's quantitative work that can confirm it, but I would invite a lot more exploration of this method. The book itself, as you'll find from the methodological appendix, appendix A, is exploratory. In other words, what I'm doing is lifting stones and kind of uh, feeling the earth and trying 
to find a way to get at what I think are the animating feelings uh, uh, that are propelling forward the movement we're faced with here. And uh, I don't think it's a finished project. It's, uh, it's exploratory. And I, I think that sociology as a whole needs a lot more exploratory work. We shouldn't be frightened of it. And we should try these things out. It's an invitation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, I'm, I have another question now. Um, Thank you for your talk. Is there a variation of the deep story that relates to minorities that are avid Trump supporters? Perhaps those who see Candace Owens as their figurehead. Yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, interesting, very interesting. I interviewed uh, a uh, African American nurse in Lake Charles who was waiting uh, for uh, Donald Trump, who touched down uh, in Lake Charles. This was, uh, uh, I guess, it was uh, three years ago, and we got to talking. And um, her big thing was, um, you know, people think that, they think in categories, think because I'm black, I'm gonna be democratic. Like they just don't wanna know who I really am. And uh, I don't like that, you know, I have a right to my own views. Will you acknowledge my individuality? Uh, is take me out of this category. That was a very strong feeling. And uh, so part of it was a defiance uh, against uh, lefty contemptuous, uh, nah, you know, well, I know who you are. Um, and it was uh, a backlash to that. But beyond that, um, she was the daughter of a store owner and uh, had done well there. And uh, she felt uh, critical of other blacks who weren't owners. Um, so there was some disaffiliation of people that were on welfare too much. Um, it had many strands to it. It had many strands to it, but she, she felt almost as if it were a step up socially to be Republican. Actually, you know, I had dinner with a homeless man. I was sitting alone at this diner and he said, oh, do you mind if I join you? So he had a Sam burger and I had mine. And I, we got to talking and I said, well, uh, who, who did you vote for? He said, oh, Donald Trump. He didn't have a home lived out of his car. Um, so uh, both race and class have these, what we sociologists call negative case scenarios that invite to be explored. Yeah, yeah. There are also, yeah, there are, it's very interesting. I'd love to see work on that. Thank you. Um, another question. In relation to fostering empathy within ourselves and towards other people, it can be frustrating when one feels that their empathy is not matched by the people they are approaching. Is there a way to reconcile the differences? Uh, it doesn't work with everybody, too. I mean, you get some people that are just uh, shouting at you, and it can feel assaultive. Um, and that's why I think a good place to start is something like the Bridge Alliance, uh, you know, because the people that come to a group like uh, Living Room Conversations, it's selective. They're going to be conservatives, but they're going to be um, 
and not necessarily moderates, but they're going to be interested in bridging themselves. Um, in fact, you know who I've heard from? I've never written a book where I've heard gotten more uh, responses, uh, letters, uh, mainly from people in the South saying, well, thank you for representing us honestly. But one, uh, or I, I get them from the left, how, you know, how could they believe that? <laughs> so I get quite a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But um, this one man uh, said, wrote and said, um, I am a evangelical minister in West Texas, Kilgore, uh, and uh, you describe the people I serve in my church, and you describe me myself. And, yeah, they're both right cute. And, um, uh, but I, I uh, don't respect Donald Trump. You know, so he, he was a very firm Republican, but not a Trump person. And he, uh, but he, he also, uh, so he was really speaking as a bridge builder from the right. And I guess that's my point. You want to find a way of starting with them. Uh, and he ended his letter to me saying, well, so it's been a terrible uh, time in American history, uh, big divide. So imagine my surprise of getting some good news from all places, you know, Berkeley, California. <laughs> so he, he, uh, he ended it that way. And I wrote him back, thank you so much for your kind words and so on, uh, and ended your friend from Berkeley, California. And he has a sense of humor too, and, and we've kept up. And now he is part of something called a high school exchange program. And uh, the last time I was in Lake Charles was last year, 2019, uh, along with a young man uh, named David McCullough, who has started a domestic high school exchange program. In other words, for sophomores in high school, you want to go abroad, abroad within the U.S., get to know people in different regions, different social classes, public schools, uh, join. And he's got these Google chat groups now, and they had a conference, um, and they have, they got a a humorist. Uh, so it's, and what it leads up to are three week visits. So you go, the south goes north, the north goes south, coasts go inland, inland goes to the coast, and they just get acquainted with one another. And uh, this guy Kilgore, I was describing, the bridge builder from the right, is part of that now. He's joined in, and some of the schools of his own parishioners are participating in it. So I could put you in touch with uh, David McCullough, or this, this minister in Kilgore, Texas, but uh, they're there. They have to be sought out. Thank you. Um, I, we're going to wind down soon. I, uh, we have to stop soon, but let, I have a couple, uh, let, let a couple more questions. Uh, Thank you for a great talk. In your research, has shame come up as an attitudinal barrier? What is the role of shame and its relationship to empathy in your experience? Wow, what a wonderful question. Shame is fundamental. I think it's really fundamental. I think uh, in a number of ways, just looking at Donald Trump, I think he is a man who has been shamed personally. I think he's had a big learning disability and a harsh father and he has been shamed. And he 
has uh, struck a chord, he, re I think, reaches out to the shamed of America. He, you know, he said, I love the poorly educated, you know, he's kind of reaching there and giving them, trying to heal them from, from what? Heal them from a shame caused by uh, a paradox of American individualism. On the one hand, American individualism uh, has it that if you succeed, you feel pride because you did it, right? It's your hard work, your effort. This is our narrative, grand narrative. And if you don't succeed, that's your fault and cause of shame. So a lot of people have tried hard, but have fallen backwards because their whole sector has been offshored and automated out. But they feel personal shame. And I think it is that, that Trump has a straw to it. He's just siphoning it out and instrumentally exploiting it. I think shame is basic. Thank you. Um, I have um, from uh, Becky Ross in our department. Uh, thank you very much. Can you reflect on where the de where the debate is in the U.S. around a guaranteed annual income as a critique of vulture and racialized capitalism? I think there is no um, mainstream. A conversation about it. I don't see it on Trump's side. I don't see it on Biden's side. But uh, I report that in my interviews in Eastern Kentucky over the last three years, I'm doing a new project there. Um, I have interviewed a lot of high school educated uh, white men who um, love Bernie Sanders. What they love about Bernie Sanders is the guaranteed annual income. And uh, doesn't mean you do nothing. You will have a job, you have purpose, but you won't starve. And they don't vote, <laughs> these, these people, but they, they love Sanders for that idea. So, I see possibilities of uh, crossover uh, and alliances, cross-racial alliances, uh, based on that idea. You have to be activated. Thank you. I'm gonna, one last question here. Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. Universities are sometimes seen as left-wing bastions, whether rightly or wrongly. What do you think is the role of the university academic community in bridging polarization and promoting empathy? Oh, wow. I think it should be a center of it. And um, uh, we should be leaders. Uh, we shouldn't be in a defensive crouch. You know, it's interesting. I've given a lot of uh, talks on this book in the last few years, and um, when I went to give a talk at Louisiana State University, uh, which is a conservative uh, state school, I was very frightened. I thought, oh my goodness, I've said a lot of critical things. I don't know how they're gonna go for it. And they were very receptive. They said, you're not telling us a lot. Knew that we didn't know We've got all these problems to work on. Or, yeah, you know, they're telling us to roll up our sleeves and get it done. So they took it that way. But I gave a talk uh, in a, um, a very well endowed uh, university in Southern California, uh, very liberal. And it was, well, you want us to talk? You know, you're asking us to talk to those races? No, no, uh, you know, that's not our job. Um, uh, they're awful, we're good. And uh, there was, uh, I thought, wow, 
I hadn't quite realized that we've got a, an issue here of, uh, of fear and an absence of outreach. And I can understand the reasons for it. A lot of people have families that are uh, oppositional to them and that uh, the university has come to seem like a safe place and they're trying to keep it a safe place. But there's a whole conversation we aren't having that we need to not only have, but become leaders in. And uh, uh, I, I will just point to one woman uh, in particular that I, I really revere. Um, she uh, teaches at uh, uh, Texas uh, Methodist University in uh, Dallas, and um, she started a program which she calls uh, Cultural Intelligence. Cultural Intelligence, and that we need to expand our cultural intelligence. And I asked her, well, how did you happen to get into this? And she said, well, um, I come from Oklahoma, she's African American, uh, and I heard about the University of Oklahoma had a fraternity, and in a bus, they were all the frat brothers together, and they were singing racist songs, you know, never will there be black brother. And one fraternity brother had a cell phone, did a video of it. And the very next day, the, all of those fraternity brothers were expelled from the University of Oklahoma, and the fraternity was shut down. And she said, but what have they learned? I thought, wow. And uh, word got out that she thought this was uh, not the way to handle it, that there was uh, no, it wasn't being handled with cultural intelligence. And what happened was the next thing she knew, the parent of one of the fraternity brothers invited her to paid her way to, to fly there. And at, when she got off the plane, all of the fraternity brothers were lined up contrite and uh, confused. Uh, but, and she, she's a short little woman, went over and gave a hug to all these guys and said, all right, well now let's go sit down and talk. And it began a long conversation. And uh, she said it's been transformative for some of these these boys who just felt you know suddenly shut out but they be, she began to explain you know what the story was like uh for african americans to hear something like that and one of them is now working in, in inner city problems and uh in um in oklahoma and so she i think uh it, uh is kind of a leader and that we need cultural intelligence. It's it, it extended and it has to have, um, uh, the university should be wonderful at it. Yeah, leaders. That's such an optimistic uh, note perhaps to, to end the talk. Uh, I, I have to ask you, you began the talk uh, mentioning civil war. And and uh, you know, wh where are we going to be in, in 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 a few weeks? Are you are do you are people that you that you've met? Do you think are they going to be seeing a solution? Are they going to accept what happens? Do you see? Are, are they having conversations of what ha what comes after? Have you talked to them about this? Yes, I've got two groups I'm talking with. Uh, one in Louisiana and one now in in. Uh, 
Kentucky, in Louisiana, they're not even listening to the news. It's, uh, they're devastated both by COVID. Uh, one person in the book has now died of COVID and they didn't take it seriously. And this, alas, um, has its cost. And um, then the storm there. But the bloom is a little bit off the rose for uh, Trump. They feel disturbed by the disorder, uh, but they are going for a law and order answer to the disturbances. They see the left as the cause of it and the right as an answer to it. So uh, they're um, both retrenched but un unchanged, I think, in their views. Um, and they're expecting trouble. They're expecting that, um, uh, they think that mail-in votes uh, might be fraudulent and that we should all go to the polls regardless of uh, COVID. I think between now and the election, it would be good to get our libraries, for example, set up uh, for uh, as new voting uh, polls. We need to get um, people uh, applying for uh, absentee ballots. Get your votes in early. I think the more we can do that in every state, um, the better and that nonetheless we will we're in for a big fight as to legitimacy of this election so i i guess the kind of work that i've been calling for uh that extends empathy bridges and cultural intelligence is a long-term work <laughs> and that um it should continue, but that in addition, we need uh, short-term fixes to the electoral system itself. And uh, to uh, get people to serve uh, in the polls. So you can go to the poll and you won't have to wait six hours. Um, if you wanna do some good in the short term, uh, especially those of you who uh, have got immunity to COVID, um, please uh, volunteer. Well, I'm talking to Canadians, so what am I? Sorry, <laughs> I forgot myself. You feel so near and dear, <laughs> but I think that's what we need in this country. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, it was delightful to have you open our year and uh, best of luck in your coming election. We all care deeply about it and waiting for your next book. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.